now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Crime drama on this Wednesday, William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig Confidential Investigator, going back to June 14th, 1953, 70 years ago today, the story of the lost lady. And we thank you for joining us on this flag day, 14th day of June, 165th day of the year, 200 days remaining. Today, as we said, National Flag Day, it's celebrated uh, commemorating the adoption of the flag of the U.S., which happened that day by resolution of the Second Continental Congress in 1777. In 1916, Woodrow Wilson issued a proclamation that officially established this date as Flag Day, and in August 1949, National Flag Day established by an act of Congress. Now, this is not an official federal holiday, though uh, on June 14, 1937, Pennsylvania became the first and only state to celebrate this as a state holiday. In 1775, the National uh, U.S. Army was founded. In 1922, Warren Harding became the first president to be heard on the radio. 1951, the first commercial computer, Univac 1, was unveiled. And in 1954, President Eisenhower signed the order inserting the words under God into the Pledge of Allegiance. In Alexandria, Virginia, on this date in 2017, a Republican Congressman and House Majority Whip Steve Scalise of Louisiana shot while practicing for a charity baseball game. Passing away on this date in history, Benedict Arnold, uh, the vo- original voice of Fred Flintstone, Alan Reed, and a couple of composers of note, Alan J. Lerner and Henry Mancini. Born on this date, author Harriet Beecher Stowe, photojournalist Margaret Bork White, musician Burl Ives, a little bitty tear let me down, uh, from uh, uh, Burke's Law, and Bat Masterson, Gene Barry, born on this date. Composer Cy Coleman, witchcraft, and uh, did the music for Sweet Charity. And uh, Junior Walker and the All-Stars saxophonist Junior Walker, all born on this date in history. Now, we have uh, Bert, other people still with us. Florence, the maid in the Jefferson's television show, Marla Gibbs, 92 years old. The Zombies, Rod Argent, 78 today. President Donald Trump, 77 years old today, President 45. British singer Boy George of Culture Club, 62. From Baywatch and Ryan's Hope, Yasmeen Bleeth is 55. He was Artie Adams on Glee. Kevin McHale is 35. And from Pretty Little Liars, Lucy Hale is 34. Those are just a few of the people who celebrate the 14th day of June as their birthday. And if this happens to be your birthday... Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. We go back 70 years to June 14, 1953. Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, starring William Gargan, and the story of the lost lady. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, right here on your favorite radio station. Hey gang, just a note to let you know that we've notified all of our radio stations that our final episode of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox will be broadcast on all of our radio stations on June 30th of 2023. 
It is not something of your radio station. It's not because you haven't been responsive. It's because my doctors have said I need to take time off and I need to take a significant time off. I can no longer work 90 hours a week. It's just that simple. So to let you know, uh, listen to the shows, enjoy the shows while you can. Go to our friend Ted at RadioMemories.com. He supplies a lot of shows. And go to our webpage at ClassicRadio.stream and learn how you can build your own classic radio collection. But again, June 30th, we'll end Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks for spending part of your Wednesday with us here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. William Gargan. Born in Brooklyn in 1905, his father a detective, his mother a teacher, graduated from St. James School in Brooklyn, and originally, he was a salesman once he left school, a bootleg whiskey to New York speakeasies, and then joined a detective agency, went on the stage uh, in Alona of the South Seas, and he appeared also on stage in Animal Kingdom. Uh, William Gargan did film work. Uh, He was in Bells of St. Mary, starring Bing Crosby and Ingrid Bergman. And uh, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his role in uh, They Knew What They Wanted. Uh, The star of that show was Carol Lombard and Charles Lawton. And uh, his first regular radio role was Captain Flagg on Captain Flagg and Sergeant Quirt. Uh, It was a Blue Network radio program, and uh, he uh, appeared in uh, Ideal in Crime and in Murder Will Out. Uh, He also was in Martin Kane Private Eye, uh, both on radio and television. Unfortunately, none of his radio work in Martin Kane Private Eye exists that I've been able to find, and uh, one of, one episode of the television show is available on the Internet Archive. Uh, and, of course, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. He, uh, he was a solid actor, but his acting career came to an end in 1958. He developed throat cancer, Doctors were forced forced to remove his larynx in 1960. And he became an activist and spokesperson for the American Cancer Society, warning about the dangers of smoking. Uh, William Gargan passing away in 1979. He was uh, uh, 73 years of age. So that's information for you on William Gargan. Thank you so much for joining us on Classic Radio Theater. And now Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, starring William Gargan, from 70 years ago today, June 14th, 1953. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Buying yourself a murder can run into pretty big money, but after that you've got nothing to worry about. The only charge for the chair you're invited to sit in is electrical. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. When you've been a confidential investigator for long enough, you don't surprise easy anymore. A man named Adolph Beck hands you a couple of hundred bucks to help his wife buy a hat, and you don't lift an eyebrow. You take the couple of hundred, and you meet Mrs. Beck the next morning at the Beck apartment. Adolph's gone to work, but you don't miss him. Barry Craig? Barry Craig. Nice. Will you wait? Sure. I, uh, I couldn't very well go shopping in this, could I? Not unless you wanted to hold up traffic. (laughs) You wait while the lady changes into something that won't hold up traffic. You decide you're being overpaid. 
Given the chance, you'd watch Mrs. Beck even if there wasn't a nickel in it. Ready? Fine. You think traffic will be safe now? Sure. I don't know about myself, though. <laughs> oh, hold it. What? I'll take a look outside first. Oh. Well, the street looks normal. Let's go. Oh, it's such a lovely day. Yeah. But that's my car. Well, can't we walk? The shop's not very far. No. Well, all right, but... Safer this way. I don't know exactly what you think you're protecting me from. I don't either. Your husband wasn't very generous with his information. Well, then... He was generous with his money, though. I'm trying to earn it. Would you believe me if I told you I didn't need any protection? Sure, but I believe your husband harder, though. Why? He's my client. I always believe my client's harder. All right. You go ahead and protect me, then. Yes, ma'am. Where's the hat shop? Well, keep right on... Oh, wait, slow down. What? That shop window. Madame Fleury? Yes. She's always got wonderful things in it. Oh, Mr. Cray. Yes? Stop the car at once. Okay. That bathing suit... The red one. Looks like a bathing suit. Can you imagine it on me? Yeah. What do you think? I think it's going to be a hot summer. <laughs> I've got to try it on. Come on. Whatever you say. Oh, I love to go shopping with a man. I don't get much of a chance. What's the matter with your husband? Adolf? Oh, he hates shopping. Good morning, madame. Monsieur? What can I show you? That bathing suit you have in the window. Ah, madame has magnificent taste. It is an imported suit. I hope I have here madame's size. Ah, oui. Altogether, I import only three such suits. Voilà. That's all there is to it? <laughs> Tiens, monsieur, it satisfies the law, no? I wouldn't know. And what is more important, it satisfies the eye of the husband. If, of course, the wife is so charming as madame... Charm isn't exactly what a girl needs for a suit like that. Oh, maybe not. But Madame has it, no? She has it. I've got to try this on. Where? This way, please, Madame. Madame will find the dressing room comfortable, I think. I must congratulate Monsieur. Yeah? There are not many women who would even dare to think of wearing such a suit. It is, of course, ridiculously expensive. It is, huh? But Monsieur will not mind paying, huh? Well, I guess he won't. I guess in the kind of deal he's got, he pays and likes it. Or anyway, pretends to like it. Madame Fleury wasn't quite sure how to take that. So she shrugged her shoulders, charmingly, the way the French do, and shut up. Time went by, and I got restless. Monsieur looks forward to seeing his wife in the suit, huh? Monsieur has been looking forward to it for too long. She's been in there over 15 minutes. Oh, a pretty woman always keeps her husband waiting, no? I wouldn't know about that. I still think she's been in there a long time. Would you mind hurrying her up? If monsieur is impatient. He's impatient. Tiens, then I go to advise madame. Madame? Madame? What's the matter? Madame does not reply. The door. She's locked. Well, let me. Yeah. Locks automatically? Automatic? No, it is necessary that one moves the latch. One has moved the latch. Respect. Mrs. Beck. Madame Fleury. Oui? Get back a bit. I'm going to break the door down. But, monsieur... I'll explain later. Right now, I'm in a hurry. But this is barbaric. Is monsieur so jealous? Monsieur is scared. Well, latch wasn't too strong. Oh. Oh, nobody home. Not even in the closet. But that door there, where does it go? The back of the shop, a storeroom. Fine. Storeroom. Nobody home here, either. But I do not understand. You and me both. You always keep that window open? May no one cannot because of the thieves. Well, it's open now. Yeah. Short drop to the alley outside. She could have managed it. Tiens, you are of the opinion, Madame Fleas? That could be the opinion I'm of. Come on. Oh, the bathing suit, yeah. She left it behind. The mystery grows... Fixing that door up is going to cost you a few bucks. Here's ten. Merci, monsieur, but what... Put the uh, bathing suit back in stock. I've got a feeling Mrs. Beck isn't going to return for it. (laughs) 
There was no occasion for yelling for the police. Mrs. Beck had a right to use the back exit if she wanted to. And there's no law against making a confidential investigator look foolish. I took my foolish look over to Beck's office and let him stare at it. But you shouldn't have let her... Mr. Beck. Yes? You handed me a couple of hundred bucks to go shopping with your wife for the next week or so. You told me you were worried about her. Of course. And the first thing you do is let her slip out of your fingers. I never had them on her. You didn't bother telling me my job was to act as a jailer. I I assumed you'd realize that... The only thing I could realize was that you figured she was in some kind of danger. Well, maybe she is. Maybe someone knew... No. There was no way anyone could have known she was going to stop at Madame Fleury's and use the dressing room there. Her disappearance had to be her own idea. Yeah, perhaps you're right. It's a little too early to call in the missing persons bureau. She's been gone only for an hour. But I know some of the boys downtown. They might stretch a regulation for me. No. No? I don't want the police involved. She, uh, she may simply have returned home. She did it the hard way. Or if she didn't, Craig. Yeah? I want you to find her. Meaning you don't really think she went home? Wherever she went, you find her. The police do that kind of thing a lot better than a one-man outfit like me. I don't care. Okay, it's your money. But I'll need a few leads. Leads? Look, Mr. Beck, New York's a large place. Also, it's furnished with trains, planes, and buses leaving it every few minutes. I've got to have some idea where she might be heading and why, or else I'm licked. I understand, but... uh... We'll do it the hard way. Who was your wife before you married her? Her... Her name was Lila Lorne. Lila Lorne? It sounds phony. It was her professional name. What profession? She sang. She was a club singer. Where'd she have her last date before giving it all up for a home and kitties? She... She was singing at the Romany Rendezvous. The Romany Rendezvous. East 40s? Yes. Fine. Before marriage, your wife was a singer named Lila Lorne, singing at the Romany Rendezvous. Now, you tell me the rest. What... What rest? You know, somebody listening in would think I was working against you instead of for you. I had to drag this information out of you. Why? There's nothing wrong with a girl singing in a nightclub. Nothing to explain a disappearing act, either. You're shrewd, Craig. Isn't that why you hired me? I didn't think shrewdness would be necessary. The way you talk, people might get the idea you didn't want her found. I do. Okay, then what's the rest of it? Before... Before Lila married me, she... She was sort of engaged to Eddie Myron. What does he do? Pitch for the Dodgers? He owns the Romany. Keep going. Well, Myron was very angry with Lila. And myself, I suppose. I've always been afraid that he might uh, do something. That's why you hired me? Yes. Myron didn't grab your wife. Nobody did. That flight out of the back window at Madame Fleury's was both unscheduled and strictly her own idea. So I understand. Meaning maybe she decided money wasn't everything? Look here, Craig, I... This is terribly difficult for me. And I'm not helping. All right, I'll get started. Uh, Only one thing. Yes? Suppose I find her and she likes it where she is. All Beck had for that was a stricken stare. Didn't look good on him and I didn't waste time admiring it. I got out. Back to William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig in just a moment. The old expression, it's a small world, has new meaning today. The world has grown even smaller. In fact, in some ways, it's too small for comfort. With modern long-range aviation, enemy planes could reach the United States from any part of the world in a matter of hours. A devastating surprise attack could occur at any time. Of course, our nation has taken steps to protect us. There is an extensive radar network to detect the approach of planes. But radar can't do the entire job. That's up to us as individual citizens. Right now, the Air Defense Command needs 300,000 more volunteers for its Ground Observer Corps. This Ground Observer Corps is made up of patriotic citizens who contribute a few hours of their spare time each week. Both men and women from teenage up can join the Ground Observer Corps and perform a valuable service to our country. Write or phone your nearest Civil Defense Center or write to Ground Observer Corps, Air Force, Washington 25, D.C. Remember Pearl Harbor and join the Ground Observer Corps. And now back to William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. It 
It was a little early for the Romany rendezvous when I got there. A handful of tourists were fighting the stakes and trying to believe they were living. There wasn't a gypsy around. Good evening, sir. I have a splendid table. Save it for the Iowa delegation. They're due any minute. I beg your pardon? Eddie Myron. Eddie Myron? He wouldn't be on public view. Lead me to him, huh? Mr. Myron is not in, sir. That sir must have hurt. All right, he's not in. You've done your duty like a nice little head waiter. Now take me to him. Hey, wait a minute. Careful, the gutter's beginning to show. What makes you so tough? Clean living. Well? You didn't mention a name. Oh, careless of me. Barry Craig, how's that? Craig? Private eye? Confidential investigator. More syllables, higher fees, class. Let's go, huh? Okay. Lila with him? Lila? A friend of yours, Mr. Craig? Very good. Forget I asked. Yes, sir. June 14, 1953, William Gargan, Barry Craig Confidential Investigator on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The news from 70 years ago today follows these messages from your favorite radio station. Just going to take a minute here to tell you about the big savings going on now, the Claret Sale at MyPillow.com. And you know, I've talked about how in my office, I have a pair of My Slippers, and they're really comfortable, and they're on clearance right now. The MyPillow.com slippers, $25 a pair, limit 10. And I would buy three or four more pairs. Unfortunately, they're out of my size. They also have sheets, pillowcases, clothing items, all on special right now. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the clearance tab at the top of the page, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Limited sizes remaining in the MyPillow slippers, limited colors on other items. MyPillow.com, clearance tab, promo code Wyatt, one 800 928-4715. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. We're listening this hour to an episode of Barry Craig Confidential Investigator as it was broadcast Sunday, June 14th, 1953 in the newspapers of that Sunday, 70 years ago. These were some of the headlines. Senator Taft, the Republican of Ohio, has thrown his weight behind a move within the Senate Appropriations Committee to slash a substantial amount, perhaps more than a billion dollars, off the Eisenhower administration's $5.4 billion foreign aid request. This puts Taft at odds with Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, Mutual Security Director Harold E. Stassen, and presumably with the president himself. President Eisenhower appeared yesterday to have won enough key votes to extend the excess profits tax, but it was uncertain whether the votes could ever be cast. Uh, Representative Reed of New York, the Republican chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, assailed the levy anew and gave no sign of calling the committee together for a showdown vote. The Supreme Court yesterday put off a decision until tomorrow whether to postpone uh, the scheduled execution of atomic spies Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The justices considered the light hour appeal during their regular secret Saturday conference after Justice Robert H. Jackson passed the decision onto the full court because he did not want to assume the responsibility of deciding alone. East Germany's red boss Walter Ulbricht, Kremlin favorite and trusted agent in the Stalin era, was reportedly on the skids last night for opposing new Soviet-backed effort for unity of Germany. Such action runs contrary to the current de-Sovietization policy undertaken in East Germany in the maneuverings of the post-Stalin regime of Premier Georgi Malenkov in Moscow. 
Street demonstrations in Korea raging through the fifth day in mounting opposition to a truce reached the point yesterday where U.S. soldiers fired carbines over the head of stone-throwing youths. More than 10,000 demonstrated in Seoul, another 10,000 demonstrating in Busan. Until yesterday, only fire hoses had been used to discourage crowds from approaching too close to military equipment. Though some of the day's top news stories is reported in the newspapers of Sunday, June 14, 1953, on your radio, William Gargan is Barry Craig Confidential Investigator. The story concludes following these messages from your favorite radio station. An episode of Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills on Thursday's classic radio theater suspense 69 years ago, June 15, 1954, The Earth is Made of Glass, starring Joseph Kearns. A laboratory experiment in murder? It's not as easy as it sounds. That's coming up on Thursday's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox anytime online at classicradio.stream. Now the conclusion of Barry Craig Confidential Investigator, June 14th, 1953. Mr. Myron's office is down the corridor. You can see the door from here. Thanks. But I'll take the sap first. Let go. Sure, the better to... Mm. Now I'll take the sap. Thanks. I get so tired of being hit on the head. You... Don't say it. We'd both be shocked. You were a little obvious, friend, asking me to walk in front of you. Now go back to the dirty napkins, huh? I'll show you the... No! Okay. Craig's made another friend. Uh, what goes... Oh, I forgot to knock. I'm terribly sorry. Who are you? The name's Craig. I also forgot to shut the door behind me. Excuse me, Mr. Myron. Wonder if there's a lock. Yes. Now, I feel better. I'd hate to have anyone walk in while my back was turned to him. Got a permit for that gun? Got any authority to ask? No. No. That makes us even. No, it puts me one ahead. I got the gun. Some days I can't keep score worth a done. Is this some uh, fancy kind of hold-up? You wouldn't keep your dough in here. I wouldn't, but you mightn't know that. Barry Craig. Do I stand and salute? You remember I'm a confidential investigator, which makes it unlikely I'm after your dough. Uh, Maybe I haven't got as high an opinion of investigators as you have. You're misunderstanding me, hurting my feelings. All I'm after is companionship. Mine? Lila's. Lila who? (laughs) You took too long on that one, fella. All right. Your business has got something to do with Lila Lorne. The name's familiar. So is the lady. So what? I'm looking for her. Here? Know any better places? Sure. Try the Beck residence. I already have. Well, then we both don't know a thing. I don't know a thing. You do. What makes you think that? I tossed Lila Lorne's name in your head waiter's lap. He tried to toss this blackjack at me. Well, that wasn't very nice of him. He missed. How does he feel about it? Painful. Well, I hope it doesn't show too badly. I wouldn't want the place to get a bad name. We're getting away from Lila Lawn. I haven't been near her in months. That's why your head waiter was so sensitive? I could pry it loose from him. Okay. Maybe I could use you on my side. Maybe even I might need you. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I got a call from Lila early this morning. First time I'd heard from her since she got married. Must have been a surprise. And it was even a pleasant surprise. She wanted me to meet her. She was upset. Beck was running short of money? Well, Beck, it seems, was running after another blonde. That's what Lila said. That's what she said. She wanted me to meet her up in Creekdale. What's Creekdale? Well, I got a kind of cottage up there. It's uh, maybe an hour out of the city. She wanted you to meet her up there this morning? You agreed? I agreed. I drove up there. The cottage was there. And Lila? No. But I hung around for maybe a couple of hours. Then I started thinking. Somebody was playing you for something. I made fast time back to town. I worried. Boyle, that's the head waiter you tangled with, got his instructions. He'd been with me all day in the apartment. Why are you breaking down and telling me all this? Well, partially because uh, Boyle lost his head when you mentioned Lorn. That wouldn't make him a good witness. And partially because I don't even know what I was being set up for. I'd like you to find out. 
I've already got a client. Beck? Yeah. What's your job for him? Finding his wife. Well, that won't have to conflict with anything I want you to do. One client at a time is all I can handle. But if I find out anything that might interest you, you'll hear from me. Or maybe from the police. That was thrown in to worry him. He was already worried, but maybe not about the right things. Even at that, he was ahead of me. I didn't even know what the right things were. I checked with Beck. His wife was still out. That left me a choice. I could do nothing. I could try the Creekdale end. According to Myron, that was a dead end. But he could be a liar. Evening. Good evening. You're the sheriff, they tell me. I guess they tell you right. I'm Barry Craig. I'm a confidential investigator from New York City. That's so? That's so. Are you uh, figuring on setting up business in Creekdale? Not exactly. Something else. I came up here to look through Eddie Myron's cottage. Yep. I thought I might find something there. I drove to the cottage before stopping here at your office. Yep. The cottage wasn't in very good shape. No. Somebody was careless with matches. Uh, looks that way, don't it? Place was burned to the ground. When did it happen, Sheriff? This afternoon. I don't know the exact time it started. Couldn't have been later than 12 or so. Any ideas about why it started or who started it? Uh, what were you figuring on uh, maybe finding in the cottage, mister? Something that might lead me to a lost lady. Uh, that's all. What uh, might her name be? Lila Lorne, perhaps. Or more recently, Mrs. Adolph Beck. Yep. Come along, son. Okay. There she is, son. What? Yep. You found her in the cottage? Yep. Like that? Like that. You couldn't have identified her. All you can tell is that she was blonde. Enough of the skin on her fingers left to get half a dozen prints. No doubt about her identity, son. She's Lila Lorne. Mrs. Beck. She was pretty. Once. Yeah. Sheriff, could that fire have been set earlier than noon, say? Maybe. Thanks. Uh, Doc Peabody's got no idea if she was dead or not when the fire got her. Not enough of her left. You got ideas? I got ideas. Names attached to them? Not yet. Well, you'll get in touch with me if you get around to attaching names to those ideas. I'll get in touch with you. Goodbye, Sheriff. Oh, uh, just a minute, son. Yeah? Uh, Doc uh, Peabody couldn't swear whether she was alive or not when the fire got to her. He'll swear to something else, though. What's that? She had a couple of bullets in her lungs. <laughs> The sheriff didn't have any expression on his face I could read when he let me have it. I held the post for a minute, couldn't think of anything else, and got out. I didn't mind the long drive back to the city. I needed it. Mrs. Adolph Beck hadn't been lovely to look at. It's open. What do you want now, Boyle? It's not Boyle. Not... Oh... Thought we were finished for the night. Not exactly. What do you want now? I've been up to Creekdale. Well, I hope you got more out of the trip than I did this morning. I got more. Tell me about it. Your cottage is never going to be the same again. Termites. What time did you leave there this morning? Oh, around 12. Hey, wait a minute. That sounds like somebody's checking alibis. Maybe somebody is. Alibis for what? Arson, for one thing. Arson? Your cottage was burned to the ground sometime today. Bur Maybe you're careless with cigarettes. I don't smoke. I think you better get out of here. Okay, but nobody really worries about arson in connection with a cheap summer cottage. What do they worry about? Lila Lawn is never going to be the same again either. I didn't give him much of a chance to respond to that. I walked out. That would give him an opportunity to figure out what his response would be. I had another job. Who, who is it? Barry Craig. Oh, come in. Thanks. Well, it's very late. I hadn't noticed. 
I hope you've got something to report. I have. You found her? Yeah. Splendid work. Is, uh, is she coming back to me? I don't think she's got any choice in the matter. I hope you didn't bully her or... The reason she's got no choice is because she's dead. Huh? Yeah. The shortest way is sometimes the kindest. She was shot and then burned to death in a summer cottage that belongs to Eddie Myron. She's gone back to him. For a while, it seems like. Or maybe a shorter while than she figured on. Have they arrested him? Not yet. But they'll get around to it once they tighten up a few things. The way it goes, your wife ducked me this morning, phoned Myron, and met him at the cottage shortly before 12. Uh What happened and why, right after that, we don't know for sure. What we do know is that Myron headed back for the city sometime after 12. And sometime after 12 was also when the cottage started burning. Oh, then it's, it's not really proof, though. No. That's why Myron's not under arrest. He's a suspect. You could be one, too. Me? You're you're joking. You've got a funny sense of humor. Motive. Another woman. According to Myron, anyway. But that doesn't matter. Because I saw you ten minutes after your wife ducked out. I spent time with you. You couldn't have made it up to the cottage in time for the shooting and the burning. Not after I left you. Oh, then you were joking. Just showing you how tricky these things can be. Anyway, the main reason I came was to tell you my job's over. Your wife's been found. I walked out. He didn't see me to the door. Loved her, hated her. The fact that she was dead meant something to him. I got out into the street and started walking, but not far. Somebody else was walking behind me. I stopped. He stopped. This wasn't my idea of fun. But it didn't matter because still another guy showed up. He didn't notice either of us, but we noticed him. I went after him, the hired man went after me. We must have made quite a procession. He turned off the pavement and walked into one of the small houses they still keep in New York City to prove that once upon a time it was a nice place to live in. I gave him a few minutes and then... While I waited for the doorbell to be answered, I scribbled a note on my card and dropped it. It would give the man following me something to think about. Yes? Police. Oh, all right. Thanks. You're not a policeman? No. Now, let's shut the door. I don't want the whole street to know I impersonated the cop, Mrs. Beck. Mrs. Beck? You sound surprised. Well, I... Maybe you're embarrassed. But the way you ducked me and Madame Fleury's this morning... I never did get to see how you looked in that red bathing suit. It's terribly late. It hasn't even begun to be late, Mrs. Beck. But I've got a problem bothering me. According to the police and to fingerprints which never lie, Mrs. Beck is dead. I... You're not dead, are you? No, which leads me to a very funny conclusion. You're not, you never were, Mrs. Beck. You don't think that conclusion is very funny? I don't know what you want, what you're thinking. I'll tell you. Eddie Myron said Beck was running after another blonde. You're blonde. So was Mrs. Beck, I figured. You still haven't... Maybe you were holding out for marriage. I wouldn't know. I'm not asking. But Beck decided he'd have to get rid of his wife. He overheard her make a date with Eddie Myron. She was scared, I guess. And so he went to work. He got hold of me, hired me to go shopping with his wife. He got hold of you. Got you to pretend you were his wife until he could duck up to Creekdale, kill his actual wife, wait till Myron had left the cottage in disgust, and then set fire. Why, that's silly. He got back to the city by 12. You were still alive then, according to what my testimony would have to be. Then you disappeared. So I think Beck couldn't have killed his wife. But he did. You prove it. I'm not doing anything. Myron put himself at the scene of the murder at the time of the murder, with no alibi. If he'd killed the girl, he wouldn't have done that. Therefore, the rest of his story has got to be believed. That leaves you. I followed Beck here. If you turned out to be someone I'd never met before, fine. Beck's in the clear, but you're not. So what else do I need? Killing, Craig. Finally came out of the woodwork, Beck. Why don't you introduce me to the lady who's going to hang with you? 
Excuse me, they don't hang you in New York. Stop it. Stop it. I didn't know about his plans to kill Lila. He just told me it was a gag for a divorce. Hey, that's not bad. Any jury with men this side of senility on it will go for that. Beck, it looks like you take it alone. I don't take anything. I can take care of her, Only trouble is, Beck, Eddie Myron was worried about me. He trailed me to your place. He trailed both of us here. I dropped a note to him when I came in. Advised him to pick a good seat. He's outside that window. You're lying. I'll take care of you first. I wasn't lying. Myron winged our boy prettily. The police thanked him. They tossed me a polite nod, too. They didn't seem to mind finding the lost lady, either. Headquarters would be a brighter place for a little while. I wouldn't be hanging around waiting for her to come out, though. I don't like red bathing suits. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Lost Lady, was written by Lou Vittis. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Jade Bracelet, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, an imported picture bride finds that marriage is murder when her future husband-to-be connives to make her set up housekeeping in the state penitentiary. Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has brought you Barry Craig, confidential investigator starring William Gargan. Featured in the role of Flurry was Joan Loring. This is Don Pardo speaking. Yes, that Don Pardo, the uh, well-renowned for uh, Jeopardy and uh, Saturday Night Live announcer for many, many years. June 14th, 1953, Barry Craig, confidential investigator on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Visit our webpage, classicradio.stream. That's classicradio.stream. Stream our shows. Learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find our social media links. You can contact me, and you can also buy me a copy. That buy me a coffee money goes toward us acquiring additional classic radio collections and helps us maintain our distribution channels. So we're here for you each and every Wednesday on your favorite station. Classic Radio Dot stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. <laughs> <laughs>